Kaja Folcher. Welcome to today's talk with Michael Dugan and Eilish Rooney, which is part of this year's special online virtual Fela, brought to you by Fela on Fobble in partnership with St. Mary's University College and the Irish News. So first of all, a warm welcome to Michael Dugan, who is Professor of European Law at the University of Liverpool and joint editor of the Common Market Law Review, which is the world's leading journal for European legal studies. He has published extensively on the problems caused by Brexit, provided regular advice to UK and EU institutions and stakeholders on the legal issues raised by Brexit, and regularly speaks at public events across the UK and Europe. A warm welcome also to local woman, Eilish Rooney, who is an emer emeritus scholar at Ulster University and a member of the Constitutional Conversations Group which has hosted a number of public conversations on the unity referendum provision in the Good Friday Agreement. The conversations have attracted great interest and gained momentum in the context of Brexit. So now I'll pass over to you, Eilish, and look forward to uh, listening to your, your conversation. Thanks very much, Joanna. Um, delighted to meet you online, Michael. Um, it's also very interesting to try out this way of doing fela. It's not a way we prefer to do, of course. Um, and normally, if you and I were having a conversation, we'd have um, a very good listening audience in front of us, possibly in St Mary's uh, College on the Falls Road, which is a regular venue for fela events. Um, but what you'd be aware of if you were there is that the audience is interested in what you have to say. Now, this year, of course, we expected to be talking about Brexit because it has been the story of the last four years. But of course, since the pandemic and since local experience of what people are going through has been absorbed by everyone, that has taken precedence over everything else. So hence we're here. And for some reason that I don't understand myself, I'm feeling more nervous about having a conversation with you than I would do if we were face to face and in front of an audience that would be about to question you whenever you're finished. So all I see my job as being is to get from you what we need to know about where Brexit's at at the moment and what you think the most important lessons are and maybe what we should look out for in the future. So what I've done is I've put together a few questions to maybe take us through that uh, journey, if you like. Um, and I'll maybe come back to you with some questions that I think an audience might ask if they were listening to us and able to ask you questions directly. So um, is there anything that you want to say before we get going? Oh, only that I'm delighted to be involved and thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks. Well. One of the things that I want to ask you, Michael, is really not about your work at the moment. I want to start with um, your own um, observations of the Brexit campaign, involvement in that campaign or observations during that campaign. I'd be really interested to hear. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think I'm on record several times, really, as saying that the, the Brexit campaign um, was really one of the most shameful exercises in political disorganization and dishonesty um, in, in modern political history. Um, and I think that's true for, for, for a variety of reasons, but you know, we, we can speculate about the motivations that led David Cameron to call that referendum. Primarily, the suspicion is as a tool of internal political management of the Conservative Party. Um, and we can also sort of highlight that the Remain campaign w was characterized by, by turns incompetence and lackluster focus on economic questions rather than questions about political identity and, and so on. Um, but more than anything, I think the main characteristic of the, the, the Brexit referendum experience was, was the, the Leave campaign um, unveiling itself as being a, a sort of full-blown purveyor of post-truth populism. Um, of the sort that we've now grown completely used to, unfortunately, from the, the Orbans, the Trumps, the Bolsonaros, and, and the rest of the right-wing cabal, <laughs> who seem to be doing quite well right, right, across, right across the globe. Um, 
and I think in that regard, it, it, it really is um, probably one of the, in hindsight, certainly some of us saw it at the time, but I think many people now see it in hindsight that, you know, Brexit, not just as the referendum, but, but as it's unfolded, is, is probably one of the greatest triumphs notched up so far for that post-truth populism of the Trumps, the Bolsonaros, the Orbans, and so on. Um, and, and really, it, it marks part of a global movement to, to try and undermine liberal social market democracy of the sort, you know, that most of us have probably lived a lot of our lives on, under across the whole of Europe. Do you have any guesstimates, speculations, thoughts about why there has been this upsurge in post-truth in the period we're living through? Um, I think that's probably a question which is beyond my pay grade to answer. <laughs> uh, it, it's difficult for me as a constitutional lawyer to speculate about the, the, the more empirical questions of why people were prepared to vote for Brexit, why people are prepared to vote for a character like Trump or Boris Johnson. It's In many respects, it's totally beyond me as, <laughs> as a person, as a citizen, let alone as a scholar. But, it, but it's really not what my scholarly activities are about. I think it is useful, though, um, maybe to separate the supply side from the demand side of populism, because I think the two issues can't be quite distinct. You know, a, a lot of people are focused on the question which you just asked, why, why do people vote for these right-wing populists when it's so patently obvious that they lie systematically, that they sell um, these undeliverable fantasies, that they manufacture these scapegoats and hit figures as a way to cover their own feelings. And, and there are lots of uh, interesting work being done about that, that supply side question, why do people, or sorry, the demand side question, why do people want to listen to these populists? I think a question which is more accessible to someone like me is the, the question of what is it the populists themselves want and why are they doing it and what are they up to? Um, and I think there, you know, the, again, there's a lot of very interesting work being done. Um, but, but effectively, from my perspective, the, they, they really are engaged in a systematic attack on the values of liberal social market democracy. And each of those four words really mean something, liberal social market democracy. Um, and they just don't like it and they want to replace it with something else. And they might have very different visions themselves of what the something else should be, um, but they simply don't like the, the model which we've grown used to since the Second World War of liberalism, of, of a social regulated marketplace, and of democratic participation, particularly by, by vulnerable and marginalized people. And they want to replace it with some, something else. And, and I think that's a, a different set of questions to why individual citizens are prepared to vote for that, even when it's patently against their own interests to do so. Yeah, how very interesting. Let's get down to your role then as a constitutional lawyer. Can you tell us something about how you came to be a constitutional lawyer, which doesn't sound like a lot of fun, can I say? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually wonderful fun. It's wonderful. Fun. Um, I mean, I think I, I, I think in some respects I'm not a particularly unusual character in the sense that Irish scholarship in general, Irish citizens and Irish scholars have made um, a, a completely disproportionate contribution to European law relative to the size of our population and um, and 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 you know that it, it's really striking the number of Irish people, I'm from Belfast myself, I'm from Andytown in fact, um, it, it's really, really striking the number of um, Irish scholars active in the field of EU law um, and the number of Irish scholars over the decades in fact who, who have made a really significant contribution to the evolution of the EU and the way that its legal system operates. So in many respects I'm just following a very well-trodden Irish path of, um, of, of EU um, constitutional scholarship. Can you say why? What's your speculation on why there are so many Irish people studying constitutional laws? It's a dead good question, isn't it? It's a dead good question. Um, I, I, think, I think for a lot of Irish people, the EU has an instinctive attraction because it's about trying to find ways for people to live together in, in, in harmony and cooperation instead of confrontation and violence. You know, that's the underlying point of why the EU exists. It's to try and overcome historical divisions to try and erase violent confrontation as a way of settling differences. And I suppose for many, many Irish people, that is just an instinctively attractive proposition. I think another thing which makes the EU attractive for, for an Irish scholar, of course, is the way that the EU magnifies 
the power and the influence of small states, especially states like Ireland or like Belgium or like the Czech Republic, um, the way that the EU offers relatively small states a, a hugely magnified degree of influence and power compared to what they would exercise on their own in the world without an organization like the EU. So I think maybe those are two of the main reasons why Irish scholars find European law, European research quite interesting. Yeah, and have made a significant contribution then to that end. Amazingly, that so. Amazingly so, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you've taken me to a place that I was intending to go later on, but I, I, I'm, I'm at it now, given what you've just said. Um, and by the way, open brackets, the people from Andy Town who are listening will want to know more about you. Maybe many of them already do, but how interesting that you come from a local area um, to where you are today. And maybe you'll tell us more about that if you want to later on. But to pick up on your um, explanation as to why Irish people um, overload the constitutional law interest in the European Union. First of all, given what you've just said and the way in which from the Irish perspective, membership of the European Union uh, affords a, a means of living more peaceably together. And certainly in view of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, and however difficult the journey has been since then, it nevertheless has been, if you like, a kind of constitutional journey in how to manage relationships on this island in such a way that the border appeared to disappear in many respects. Uh, just can you tell me something about your concerns in relation to that as to where we are now? Um, in the unsettled place we are in, which we'll speak about how we got here yeah. shortly, but you know, the unsettled place we're in at the moment. Can you tell us something about what your concerns are? I mean, I think, I think it's worth starting off from the, 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 the proposition, which I don't think anybody realistically can challenge, that um, Northern Ireland, um, and I'm gonna to refer to it as Northern Ireland <laughs> rather than the North of Ireland or the occupied six counties, just because from, from an EU legal perspective, that's, that's, the, that's the name which it's given in the EU context. So I'll use the vocabulary of my profession. Um, Northern Ireland is the part of the UK which is going to be most deeply affected by Brexit. And I don't think anyone really uh, can, can doubt that. Equally, the Republic of Ireland, as a member state of the EU, is going to be the part of the EU which is most deeply affected by Brexit. So when you put those two things together, the island of Ireland is, is going to suffer the worst of the consequences of the, the UK's decision to leave the EU. Now, we can disaggregate those consequences into, into various different categories. You know, there, there, are some, there are some problems and challenges which there's not very much that anyone can do anything about by negotiation between the EU and the UK. You know, we have this withdrawal agreement, we have this protocol, and they try to address some of the problems caused by Brexit, but there are other problems which nobody can do very much about through that process of negotiation. For example, the simple fact that Northern Ireland's economy is relatively highly dependent upon public sector employment, is relatively highly dependent upon EU migrant labour, is relatively highly dependent on EU agricultural subsidies. You know, the, the, those are all things which are going to change and there's not much um, that a withdrawal agreement between the EU and the UK can do about it. Similarly, the Republic's economy is deeply, deeply intertwined with that of the UK in manufacturing and financial services and supply chains and so on. Um, there's not very much that a withdrawal agreement can do to, 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 to address the disruption which is going to happen to those supply chains and financial service relationships and so on. The withdrawal agreement then is more focused on the problems that can be addressed or resolved through bilateral agreement between the EU and the UK. Um, and of those problems, then there are, there are several, you know, we have the problem about the, the equality and um, non-discrimination framework provided by EU law. Um, we have problems around the single electricity market on the island of Ireland. Um, but, but by far the biggest problem, of course, relates to the border, which, which you've already alluded to, Alish. Um, in that regard, though, we, we have to completely separate two different types of borders. There's the border for the movement of people, and then there's the border for the movement of goods. 
Um, and they both have entirely different legal frameworks, entirely different challenges, and very different solutions as well. So I'll just mention maybe briefly the border for, for, for Persians. Um, I mean, in, in fact, the border for Persians doesn't have very much to do with EU law at all, because the border for Persians is really about the bilateral understanding between the UK and Ireland, which we call the common travel area, and the ability of people to move between north and south without having to show a passport or undergo um, immigration controls as a, as a mutual understanding between Ireland and the UK. And so really it was up to Ireland and the UK to decide whether they wanted to keep the common travel area after Brexit. And the decision which they took, of course, was yes, they do want to do that. Now, the UK did have concerns, whether we sympathise with them or not is a different question, but the UK did have concerns that if, if it left the EU and adopted, as it intends to, a significantly more restrictive immigration policy, particularly towards EU nationals, that somehow the Republic can become what we call a, in, 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 the, in the sector a soft underbelly. You know, EU nationals could enter the Republic and then enter England or Scotland um, with, through the open border of the common travel area um, and effectively become the soft underbelly for an immigration route into the UK. The UK has basically accepted that that will exist and it will be the responsibility of the UK authorities to manage that internally. For example, when uh, uh, job offers are being made or bank accounts are being opened or housing is being rented out. Now that has, of course, very significant social implications. It effectively means that the UK's future immigration strategy in order to save the common travel area with Ireland and prevent a hard border um, with Northern Ireland is effectively to transform most of the population into private policemen and women on behalf of the UK immigration authorities. You know, effectively, we're all being co-opted into the policing of the UK's immigration policy. I so. But, but it also means that, uh, oh, because um, whenever any of us are offering a job, it'll be us who has to check people's entitlement to that job in an immigration sense. Whenever someone wants to rent a house site, it'll be them who has to check the prospective tenant's immigration status. You know, we're all going to become, in effect, private immigration authorities for the UK government. Um, but of course, it doesn't mean that the common travel area is, is, is guaranteed in perpetuity. It still only is a bilateral understanding between the EU, I'm sorry, between the UK and Ireland. So there'd be nothing to stop a future right-wing government in the UK, for example, under pressure from the Daily Mail or the Daily Express to, to close the soft underbelly. It's not likely to happen, but of course it will always remain a possibility. Even from Ireland's perspective, I suppose, the common travel area only, only serves a particular purpose. Um, and if, for example, there were to be a future referendum on reunification and the North were to join the Republic within the context of the EU, then there would be a really interesting question for Ireland about whether it wanted to maintain the common travel area or become a fully fledged member of the Schengen zone, for example. So the, 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 the border of is... Can you just explain the Schengen first? Oh, um, so Schengen is the... Um, if the common travel area is a sort of passport-free zone between the Republic and the UK, uh, effectively it's like a mini Schengen area as it exists in the rest of Europe. So most of the countries of the EU, apart from the Republic in the UK and a few other non-EU states like Norway and Switzerland, form this uh, passport-free zone um, where you can travel internally uh, without passport controls and, and immigration checks. Now, obviously, we know that in times of uh, particular crisis, such as the virus, um, passport controls can be reintroduced. But in principle, the Schengen zone is like a giant version of the common travel area or the common travel area is like a mini version of the Schengen zone. But, but the UK and Ireland have never fully participated in that Schengen travel free area of the rest of the EU. They've maintained their own sort of mini Schengen um, just between themselves. But Ireland does have the option, if it wants to, of terminating the common travel area and fully joining the Schengen area with the rest of the EU. The only circumstance under which I think that would ever happen is if there was reunification and Ireland decided that full membership of the Schengen area was more in the national interest than maintaining a common travel area with England, Scotland and Wales. Right. Oh my goodness, there's a lot to take on board there, Michael. And, and that's the 
easy bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to be a roller coaster to those who are watching and listening. But those first set of anxieties and concerns that you articulated will have serious economic impacts, both in the North and in, in the Republic. If we can just talk about the North for a moment. Um, each of those areas that you outlined at the very start of your explanation as to where we are at the moment. I mean, you know, one of the one of my own research interests is the lives of marginalised women, both in the course of the conflict and in the transition period. And their lives are often forgotten about, as are the lives of people in other marginalised groups, um, you know, black ethnic minority groups the traveller community, um, you know, basically people who become forgotten about very often. And as you're, and their lives are already deeply advantaged and marginalised in many areas across the North. But what you're telling me is that as a consequence of Brexit, of the impact of Brexit, that disadvantage will deepen, to say nothing of the longer impact of the pandemic, you know, economically here and in terms of employment and so on. And I know it's not your, that is not, this is outside your area of expertise, but it's not outside your area of human concern for people's lives. Uh, how do you foresee the impacts or can you possibly foresee the impacts of the economy in, in the North? Um, you're right, it, it is outside my expertise um and i think i think i've got to be very careful you know if one of my key messages over the past several years has been don't listen to charlatans who pretend that they know things that they clearly know nothing about i've got to be very careful not to fall into the same trap myself you know that um skill and experience and knowledge and training exists to get, help us give better answers to the questions that we have the skill and the training and the knowledge to answer um, I think the most useful thing I can say is that, um, you know, the, the, the situation facing both the North and the Republic is going to be one of significant economic challenge directly as a consequence of Brexit. Now, given that all of the social science and the empirical understanding which flows from that basic legal proposition says that whenever an economy goes downhill or takes a hit, it tends to have a disproportionate effect on certain parts of the population, usually the most mar marginalized and the most, most vulnerable. We would naturally expect that to be true also of the impact of Brexit. It would be very surprising if Brexit, uniquely among the economic hardships experienced by the human species, were, were not to impact upon particularly marginalized and vulnerable groups. Um, I think there, one of the difficulties in trying to analyze that, you, you've already alluded to, Eilish, is that um, we're, we're adding on top of Brexit the impact of a global pandemic, health and economic crisis as well. And, and of course, that will make it very difficult to try and disaggregate the components of whatever comes next, which can be attributed specifically to the impacts of Brexit from the, the wider economic and, and social crisis, which is going to follow from the pandemic. But certainly, you know, the, the experience of humanity is if you're going to deliberately inflict damage upon an economy, that damage is not suffered fairly and squarely and equally across society. Yeah. Isn't it interesting, Michael, um, listening to you say that as you're talking and thinking of the circumstances under which we are having this conversation, which is Phil and Fobel, the largest community festival on these islands, really. And I'm thinking that this emerged, these events and these celebrations emerged from a situation of dire conflict and you know circumstances that anyone from the outside looking in on would think it wasn't possible to do what people here in grassroots communities actually on very few resources managed to do and managed um, out of a collective will and agency to transform what seemed to be, you know, a hopeless future into an occasion where people could debate and discuss and come together and exchange views. So I just want to say that out there that 
as you say, it's so true um, that people, we're not all in this together at all, and not certainly at the same level, whether you're talking about a pandemic mm. or an economic crisis, mm. but that um, also the spirit of people to um, make the best of what they have using their own resources is something that we should never lose sight of, and FIELA is testing to that. And I'll just add a, I'll just add another little observation onto that, um, on, on, onto that as well. You know, one of the great privileges of my job on, until fairly recently was that um, you know, I spent a huge amount of time with my colleagues from France, from Germany, from Italy, from Sweden, from Denmark, you know, all over Europe. Um, and if there is a positive to come out of Brexit, I don't think there are very many positives to come out of Brexit at all. But if there is one positive from an Irish perspective, um, the way that this whole process has shone a light on the Irish situation for, for a huge audience of Europeans has been really quite phenomenal. The level of interest in Ireland, the level of interest in gaining a greater understanding of life in Northern Ireland, the, 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 the admiration as well, I think, which has been shown for Ireland as a state, you know, um, as, a, as a small but incredibly stable, incredibly democratic and forward-looking country at a time when a lot of other countries in Europe are not going in that direction, has won Ireland a lot of admirers and a lot of supporters. And I think especially when it comes to understanding the situation in, in the north of Ireland as well, the Brexit process has shone a lot of quite unflattering lights on, on the, 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 the UK's handling of Northern Ireland as a territory. Um, and, and also, I'd, I, I, I should point out, you know, has shone a lot of unflattering light, for example, on the DUP as a political force um, within Northern Ireland and the way that its uh, machinations with the May government and then the Johnson government have actually, in the end, um, risked doing significantly more damage to Northern Ireland than even the UK government was minded to do um, already. So I think from that perspective, there maybe has been a positive out of Brexit, that this more general European understanding of the Irish situation and a lot of admiration for the way that the Irish government has handled the whole process. Very interesting. I found what you had to say also about the common travel area really very interesting, Michael. And, you know, full of insights and knowledge that I, I, I didn't have that I don't remember. Maybe I had it at one point. You hear something and you hear it and, and you forget it. And it's so interesting to hear it being pressed home again, just what the situation is going to be like. And what on what you've just said, and, and I, I was hoping that that's what we would move into next is, you know, you've talked about the common travel area in relation to the border. Now, the political dimensions of the border and, and what's ahead in relation to the, the um, negotiations so far and the main documents that have been signed off on so far. But you might be interested, before you go into that, you might be interested to know that the Constitutional Conversations Group that I'm a part of, we've held really interesting conversations with people from unionist background, with people who would be DUP voters, um, you know, in public and in private around the constitutional challenges that face us as a people that share a small space of land. You know, how these challenges will be faced by us together and how the commitment in the Good Friday Agreement to a referendum, to a unity referendum at some stage in the future, how will we manage that? How do we as a people with common concerns with grassroots communities, how do we manage that challenge and opportunity in the future. So, you know, what's been interesting is at a level at which it wouldn't necessarily be visible mm. and that, you know, uh, political parties might be participating in in different ways, um, but isn't on the horizon of the media platforms that are on the go at the moment, you know. But I think you might be interested and, and hopefully those conversations will bear fruit at mm. some time in the future. But, you, you know, you may, we may be talking about a long-term, a relatively long-term period of people preparing for a referendum. Um, and when I say long-term, you know, in my lifespan, that means like about, you know, a few years anyway. Uh, maybe, maybe even in my lifetime, who knows, as we all say. But I'd love to have your insights into where do we stand um, politically in relation to where we're at at the moment. Yeah. Um... Oh. It, it, again, I'll, I'll divide what I can say professionally from 
from what I can say personally, and I think on the question, for example, of a, a, a referendum and reunification, um, I think we're all entitled to have an opinion on that, <laughs> not just not just the experts, of course. Um, and, and as an Irish citizen, I, I certainly feel like I'm entitled to have an opinion on it very directly. Professionally speaking, um, there are, of course, interesting questions about um, what, how to manage the process of reunification. Um, the EU has a degree of experience of this before um, because of the reunification of Germany. You know, um, Basically, what we'd be talking about with Ireland is that, that Northern Ireland would be um, would join the Republic within the EU and would, there wouldn't be an accession process. Northern Ireland wouldn't be trying to join the EU as a new member state or anything like that. Northern Ireland would effectively automatically re-become part of the EU through its reunification with the Republic. Um, but the German experience does flag up that, that, of course, the EU and the other member states have a very legitimate interest in that process. While they can't stop it and probably wouldn't want to, of course, they do have legitimate interests at play that need to be managed. For example, Northern Ireland would, would have to absorb, um, uh, or, or sorry, become part of the Eurozone. So how do you manage the, the conversion of the currency in Northern Ireland to become a fully, fully fledged part of the Eurozone? But also, how do you stop that creating, for example, certain financial instabilities for the Eurozone as a whole? So the whole process would have to be managed. We already mentioned as well, you know, the choice face in the Republic with, with no hard border, a risk across the island anymore, would the Republic want to fully become part of the Schengen zone along with the rest of Europe, or would it want to remain part of the common tra travel area with what is left of the UK? So from a professional perspective, there are really interesting questions about how the Republic negotiates the process of reunification with its partners across the rest of Europe, who do have a valid interest in, in some of the decisions that would need to be taken. I think from a personal point of view, of course, and, and, and I'm uh, fully supportive of Irish reunification, I'd <laughs> be surprising if I came from Andy Town and wasn't, um, but, but of course I think there are also important questions that the Republic would have to ask about its absorption capacity. You know, the Republic, I think, has to be quite sure um, that it's actually able to carry out the whole process of reunification um, without destabilizing its own economy on Julie and also accommodating quite legitimately the concerns of Northerners. Um, and, and, you know, I'll just give a couple of examples. The, the health service. You know, I think the Republic probably needs to ask itself some really quite difficult questions about the nature of its own health service and the gap of expectation which exists with people living in the North and whether, you know, reunification would actually be an opportunity to, to radically rethink the way that the Republic's social and health services are structured. Um, another example, you know, how, how, how will the Republic decide to politically manage the North in itself? Will, it, will, will there be a unitary state? Will there be greater devolution? Will it, you know, difficult questions about how to manage these, um, these issues. So I think for, from a personal point of view, yes, of course, I'm, I'm an Irish nationalist who believes in reunification as, a, as a, a, an aspiration. Um, but I think we also have to be realistic about some of the, the really enormous challenges which will face the entire process, but also cognizant of some of the lessons that Germany, for example, learned through its very similar process of reunification within the context of EU membership. Yeah. Well, putting your constitutional lawyer's hat back on now, Michael, you've talked about the common travel area, you know, the border in terms of people. Yeah. Um, what about goods, you know, as you know well, the majority of people in the North voted to remain in the EU. Uh, the way things have worked out since 2016, uh, there has been an increase in the number of people in the North who would prefer to remain in the EU. And as things are working out now, COVID included and COVID notwithstanding, you know, however you look at it, it appears to a, a number of people who've commented on this that the economy of the North is going to suffer so much that the prospect of rejoining the European Union holds economic attractions amongst 
human rights attractions amongst a number of other things that are that are very favorable but so setting all of that acknowledging all of that and as i say you know setting that to one side um from your you know constitutional expertise where do we stand in relation to you know the border down the irish sea or you know where do we stand in relation to all of that right now as as negotiations have taken us this far through sure um and and the the there are the, we should probably divide that question into three main parts there's the sort of wh why is it such a big problem there's the what is the solution that we're going to have to live with and then there's thirdly the question of what are the big challenges with that solution um because the solution is almost as problematic as the problem <laughs> it's trying to solve um so i'll just say a few words um about each of those and again stop me if i start rambling on constitutional lawyers may have their defined expertise but we have an incapacity to ramble um uh, the, the problem in a way is 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 fairly straightforward i, I mentioned before that you know the, the the border for persians between the north and the south wasn't really very much to do with the eu at all because ireland and the uk have this common travel area which is effectively outside the scope of of eu law um, in a way, the border for goods is entirely the opposite because the border for goods is all about the customs union and the single market. And basically, whenever you have a customs territory and the EU as a whole is a single customs territory, um, rubbing shoulders with another customs territory, any other customs ter territory on earth, then you've got systems of tariffs, you've got systems of public safety controls and checks, you've got formalities and paperwork, you've got issues about smuggling and criminality. You know, that, that's just the way the world works. When one customs territory rubs against another customs territory, there are borders. And, and managing those borders is the responsibility of the EU on behalf of its member states. Now, Brexit didn't have to lead to really serious border problems in Ireland because the UK could have decided to leave the EU, but still remain very closely aligned with the EU in customs and regulatory terms. And in that case, you know, the softest of soft Brexits, if you like, the border problem wouldn't really have existed. The border problem really exists, not so much because of Brexit, but because of the fairly hardline and extremist view of Brexit, which was adopted first by the May government and now especially by the Johnson government. The UK wants to leave the EU customs territory and wants to diverge from EU public and environmental and safety standards. And that's what creates the, the, the threat of a hard border between the UK and the EU as a whole, but also therefore between the North and the Republic in particular. Now the question is, how do you solve that border problem, obviously? Mm -hmm. So that, that's the problem. Um, the solution which Boris Johnson has insisted upon is, is an incredibly complicated one, but we can break it down into, into three main components. First of all, when it comes to relations between Northern Ireland and the Republic and the EU as a whole, um, in effect, Northern Ireland is gonna remain governed by large swathes of EU regulation to do with the manufacture and the marketing of goods. Yes. And that helps avoid regulatory and checks and inspections to protect the public across the island of Ireland. It, it, it also has certain problems, of course, you know, the, 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 from an EU perspective especially, because those rules will be applied and enforced within Northern Ireland by the British authorities. And that means that the EU has effectively allowed the public bodies and officials of a third country to police the EU's own border. Have and they done that anywhere else? Sorry? Have they done that anywhere else? Not really. This is a little bit of an experiment from an EU perspective. Okay. Um, now, it does happen to a degree, for example, uh, uh, with the, the, the territories of the European economic area, Norway and Switzerland, and so on. There is, of course, a degree of mutual trust which characterizes the regulatory enforcement um, strategies of the Norwegians or the Swiss in relation to the EU, but, but the arrangement for Northern Ireland is going to be really quite, really quite something else. There are, of course, important questions for the EU to ask about whether the UK authorities will take that job seriously, whether they will actually do it properly and rigorously, because, of course, the, the border between the North and the Republic is also the border between the whole rest of the world 
and the EU. So, so that's the first question. You know, Northern Ireland will, in its relations with the EU, be, be governed by significant parts of EU law, but enforced and applied on the ground by the UK authorities. When it comes to trade between Northern Ireland and England, Scotland and Wales, the situation is more complicated because certainly what will happen is that there will be checks on goods moving from England, Scotland and Wales into Northern Ireland. Now, we know that Boris Johnson did his best to lie about this repeatedly and claim that this wouldn't, wasn't going to happen. Of course it's going to happen. It's written in the text of the protocol and the withdrawal agreement, and now the UK government is publishing its plans for what those checks are going to look like. Um, of course, the concern there is that Northern Ireland will, first of all, it will be more expensive and more complicated for Northern Irish uh, consumers and businesses and supply chains. Secondly, that it might end up that certain suppliers in England, Scotland or Wales simply no longer believe that it's economic to export to Northern Ireland and decide that simply to cut it off as a market. Um, we'll just have to see how that happens. But again, coming back to what we said before, you know, the, the common experience of humanity is if you're going to make life more complicated and expensive and difficult, it tends to have an impact on people's lives. But in a way, the third and probably the most challenging part of the, the border arrangements for Northern Ireland relates to customs duties. Um, so what they've agreed under the protocol is that all goods entering Northern Ireland will have to pay EU customs duties. Um, because they are considered to be at risk of entering the EU through the Republic. So there's no border controls on the island of Ireland, means that all goods entering Northern Ireland might well enter the Republic and might well then enter the EU single market and customs union. So it's presumed that all goods entering Northern Ireland will have to pay EU customs duties, unless you can prove that they're just going to stay within Northern Ireland itself. And in that case, you can have the customs duties reimbursed from the UK authorities or partially reimbursed if, the, if they, for example, come from, uh, from America or China or wherever. Incredibly complicated system, which is effectively going to be based on this bureaucratic nightmare of payment and then claiming reimbursements or partial reimbursements. Um, with lots of paperwork and lots of additional processes. Um, now, th this is what we call the, the sort of guinea pig regime of the, the dual customs system. Um, and there's a good reason, of course, why pretty much nowhere else on planet Earth does this. It's because it's not a great idea. Um, and probably more interesting than that, you know, the, the, when, when the UK government first proposed this system several years ago, um, the Brexit campaigners including Boris Johnson, completely uh, criticized it as being untested, unworkable, deeply damaging, uncompetitive, you know. Um, and yet, just, just several months later, this is the system that they decided they were going to foist upon Northern Ireland. Um, now, again, for me as a lawyer, I can, I can say what the system is. This is the complicated, bureaucratic, complex, undesirable system which will be imposed from January 2021. Of course, it's the empiricists who will have to work out what the real life implications of that are. What sort of dampening and effect does it have on business and investment? How does it affect supply chains between Northern Ireland and the rest of the world? How does it affect prices and consumer choice for individuals within the North? Those are all the questions which we'll have to work out over time. But certainly we can say from a legal perspective that this is a very complicated um, system which is going to have significant impacts upon the way that the economy operates. I'm kind of pausing because you've silenced me, Michael. Ooh. It sounds, you know, you know it, just the enormity of it, the complexity of it, and that, you know, we are going to be guinea pigs in a, a situation that is going ultimately be to be so costly in, in terms of people's everyday lives here. I mean, I can imagine businesses, business owners listening to you and, you know, they have already registered their concerns elsewhere. But with little that they can do about that is, as you're saying, you know, this is, this is the solution that's proposed. 
And I think, I think there's a real catch-22 situation, in fact, for Northern Ireland, because, you know, you asked me sort of earlier, what, what are my main concerns about, <laughs> about the current situation facing the North? And, and in a way, it's sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't, because the first main concern is that the, the Johnson government is so untrustworthy and so cynical that, that they're actively going to go out of their way to, to frustrate the operation of the arrangements which have been agreed with the EU to avoid a hard border. And, and we've already seen plenty of evidence of that. You know, Johnson's recurrent claims that, that, that are directly contradicted by the black and white text of his own agreement. The UK published its initial proposals for implementing this protocol just, just several weeks ago. And, and, you know, people like me had already identified a whole series of problems and contradictions and deviations from the agreement itself. So I think the first main worry really is that, that the UK government either just doesn't believe that these problems exist or doesn't support the solutions that they themselves signed up to. In fact, they themselves proposed with the EU or, or simply doesn't care about the consequences because Northern Ireland just doesn't figure in their, their broader calculations. Yeah. So, so that's the first main worry is that this protocol might actually just immediately run into dispute and difficulty and, and um, confrontation. But the second main worry is that even if this protocol works, <laughs> even if it, the UK fully and faithfully implements it and applies it exactly as it should be done, that that in itself is also a really negative thing because while it may well avoid a hard border between the North and the Republic, it does also create this whole series of problems for the EU, for the UK, for Northern Ireland itself. And I think, you know, in a way, the protocol is the perfect embodiment of the fact that there is no such thing as a good Brexit. You know, it just, it just doesn't exist. Every Brexit is problematic and difficult. Um, so even if this protocol works and the UK government in good faith makes it work, that's still problematic for Northern Ireland. So it's, it's a bit of a rock and a hard place. Yes. Um, Michael, we're coming to the end of our conversation. And I suppose I've just got one question to ask you and then open the floor if there's anything that you want to say to our viewers uh, to end with. But my question is, how do you think the negotiations are going to go? I suppose this is asking you again to maybe, you know, take off your mortar board, get out the crystal ball, but have an informed look as to what you see ahead. Um, I mean, all we hear repeatedly in the absence of very much coverage on Brexit is that their negotiations aren't really happening, that there's nothing going on, that really, you know, a crash out is what's wanted and that's what looks what's going to happen. I don't know. Tell us your view. Tell us what you see uh, coming. Yeah. Um, I mean, here, here I think we've got to to just remember where we are at the moment. Um, yeah. You know, the, the UK left the EU in January of this year, but, but, but on the ground, actually nothing has changed for public bodies, for businesses, for private individuals and citizens, because we're currently living through what's called the transition period. And the transition period is provided for under the withdrawal agreement between the EU and the UK. It's basically maintaining the status quo for a fixed period of time to give everybody um, uh, space and, and time to, to adjust to the consequences that will come in due course. So in a, in a way, the UK has left the EU, but nothing has actually changed. And we haven't actually experienced yet any of what leaving the EU actually means. Now, uh, the transition period is due to expire on the, first of, uh, on the 31st of December of uh, 2020. So from the 1st of January this year, um, yes. that's when the UK is actually going to experience what it really means to have left the EU and become a third country. Everything will change at that point from a constitutional and legal and a regulatory point of view. So actually, the, 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 the big dit in this whole process was not January 20. 20, it's January 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the reason why they had this transition period was to give the two sides, the UK and the EU, time to negotiate what their future relationship would look like. Um, but because everybody knew that that time was already looking quite short, 
Um, there was also a facility to extend the transition period. And the UK actually asked for this facility. This was a UK request, not, not an EU one. Um, so the transition period can be extended to give the two sides more time to prepare, to talk, to negotiate, to plan, and so on. Now, the Johnson government took the decision for totally ideological reasons and without any particular evidence or analysis that it would not extend the transition period under any circumstances whatsoever, not even a global health and economic crisis prompted by the virus. So what that means is that the transition period is going to expire in about six months' time, and everything has to be ready by that point. Everything. The UK's internal preparations, the situation as regards Ireland, North and South, the UK's international relations, everything will change in January. Um, and I think that's the point that we're at at the moment. And, and I think one of the big things we've all got to look out for over the next coming months is how are those preparations progressing? What, what will be sorted out by January? What will still be left up in the year? And from there, we'll be able to work out what the likely problems are going to be. It, it is an incredibly, uh, it's just very difficult to believe that any responsible government has brought this situation upon itself. In effect, the UK has decided to heap a Brexit New Deal crisis yes. on top of a global pandemic crisis um, with no apparent evidence or studies or analysis to guess at what the consequences might be. Um, so I suppose that's the big thing we've got to look out for. Yeah, yeah. And in some ways, it it might be said that the COVID pandemic is providing cover. In a, you know, it isn't providing cover, but in a way, because the focus of media attention has been on the pandemic, these things that you're speaking about are almost going without notice, unless in some of the, some of the press or some of the academic articles. Um, Michael, this has been a wonderful workshop in where we're at in relation to Brexit. I've learned so much and I think people who would have been at the FELA audience and who will watch this will learn a great deal too. A great deal that's very, very worrying indeed about where we are at the moment. And I look forward to next year's FELA when maybe we can all meet face to face and look back and see. Um, and I can certainly see that the Constitutional Conversations Group has its work cut out for it in the immediate future as well as longer term. Is there anything that you'd like to say to our FELA audience before we leave? Just to say thank you very much for having me. It's been really interesting to talk to you, Eilish, and good luck with the rest of the festival. Thank you very much, Michael. Cheerio. All the very best. Bye-bye.